Okay. Well, hi again. We are in the second part of our basic infertility panel. Now we have uh, three sessions. The first session is going to be presented by Professor Pınar Özcan. Pınar Özcan was graduated in 2003 from Gazi University and she uh, accomplished his residency in the same place. And now she is working as a professor in the infertility unit, and as well as she's performing uh, reproductive surgeries in Bezmi Adam University. And she's going to uh, summarize us the stimulation modalities based on ovarian response. The field is yours. Thank you, Dr. Pınar Özcan. Have a good weekend for all. First, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Emre, my good friend, uh, for this great uh, organization and gave me a chance to join us. Uh, right now, I'm going to talk something about individualizing OER stimulation strategies based on OER response. Actually, we try to achieve maximum pregnancy chance per IVF cycle with minimal health risk, with maximum number of oocyte retrieved, and with reasonable cost. We know ovarian stimulation is a considerable uh, proportion of ovarian uh, uh, overall cost of IVF treatment. That's why we need to do the best during ovarian stimulation with low dropout rate and with maximum pregnancy chance. At that time, we need to answer the question, more is better or less is more for oocyte retreat. We know there is a uh, the number of oocyte retreat and pregnancy chance during IVF treatment. We have a magic number or not. Right now, we're going to try to answer this question. Before making a decision how to stimulate the patient at the beginning of ovarian stimulation, we need to evaluate the ovarian response uh, and ovarian reserve by using ovarian reserve marker. We can uh, classify all patients undergo IVF treatment in terms of ovarian, ovarian response uh, into three categories, hyper response, normal response, and hyper response. We can use several markers for the prediction of ovarian response, including women age, ovarian reserve, and body mass index. The accurate prediction of ovarian reserve means the accurate prediction of ovarian response. We have two strong markers for the prediction of ovarian reserve, AMH, and antra follicle count, Lamarca defined both of them as two phases of the moon. There is no meaningful data to show uh, the superiority of one uh, over the other one. You can use both of them for the prediction of ovarian response in your daily practice. However, th this both marker can perfectly predict ovarian reserve, but age is still the best predictor for the prediction of ovarian response. We need to evaluate the importance of all markers together. What does it mean? If woman is under 35 age, she has approximately 13 percentage of pregnancy with low AMH level 0.4. However, she if she is over 37, she has only 5% of pregnancy during IVF treatment with a serum AMH level 0.4. Sunkara, I'm gonna show the result of Sunkara's study. It's very well known study and important study. They evaluated uh, the importance of the number of oocyte retrieved uh, according to uh, women age they conclude that there is a strong relationship between the, uh, between the number of oocyte retrieved and live birth rate during IVF treatment across all female age groups. If she can obtain approximately 15 oocyte during IVF treatment, if patient is between uh, 18 and four, uh, 34 age, she has approximately 40 percentage of pregnancy. However, she is over 40 
years old. Uh, she has only 16 percentage of pregnancy with 15 oocytes. What about the polio study? Uh, polio as well uh, evaluated the importance of the number of oocyte rate uh, uh, on IVF outcome rate. Uh, they are uh, exactly uh, demonstrated the significant progressive increase of uh, cumulative live birth rate and number of oocyte rate rivet. Lamarca uh, classified all patients by using antrafoil count and AMH level as an ovarian marker into two groups. They uh, recommended uh, generate antagonist protocol with low uh, starting FSH dose in hyporesponder, but they recommend antagonist pro the use of antagonist protocol with starting a high starting FSH dose uh, in poor responder patient. What about the optimate study? It's very well known study. It's mouth centric random, uh, randomized controlled study. They used antra follicle count as ovarian reserve marker. And according to number of uh, antra follicle count, they divided all patients that undergo IVF treatment into three categories, pre-responder, hyper-responder, and normal responder. After that, they divided all uh, each uh, group uh, into two arms, individualized and standard standard uh, arms, and they try to evaluate the ovarian reserve marker driving individualized IVF treatment. According to their result, they concluded that uh, in a poor responder patient, you can increase uh, starting FSH dose. It does not improve live birth rates, just just uh, it uh, results from greater cost. But we, I need to highlight some uh, methodologic er errors related to Optimus study. They use only antra count as ovarian reserve marker. We know antra count can show uh, inter-observer variability. And the second one is uh, that the all uh, most uh, protocol is agonist protocol, approximately 80 percentage of all pr uh, protocols. They uh, evaluated the number of antrafolicule count after starting agonist protocol. It can uh, change the number of antrafolicule count as well. And it is open label study with selective cancer criteria, and there is no evaluation in terms of protocol. Uh, in this study. What about the secondary analysis of optimist study? Uh, in secondary analysis, they only evaluated the results of hyporesponder patient. According to the secondary analysis of optimist study, they concluded that female HM body mass index seems to modify the effect of starting FSH dose for individualizing in hyporesponder patient. If you can decrease starting FSH dose in high responder, you can reduce the risk of OHSS. Uh, uh, but it may also reduce the chance of pregnancy, especially in young women. They also evaluated cost effectiveness. According to their cost effectiveness analysis, they uh, demonstrated they, that the individualized strategy more expensive. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, a coherent uh, analysis result. There is no meaningful data to provide a clear justification for adjusting standard dose in poor and normal responder patients. But you can decrease starting uh, FSH dose at the beginning of ovarian stimulation. You can uh, reduce the risk of OHSS in a hyperresponder patient. I'm going to show the result of ESTER trial. ESTER trial is uh, as well uh, a RCT uh, or, uh, to evaluate ovarian reserve marker driving individualized IVF treatment. They used uh, age and uh, AMH level as ovarian reserve marker. After their result, they concluded that optimizing ovarian response in IVF cycles for individualizing F starting FSH dose. Uh, on based on uh, patient characteristic results in similar efficacy and improved safety compared with conventional ovarian stimulation. 
Actually, we can use also uh, Poseidon criteria for individualizing uh, ovarian stimulation strategy in our daily practice. They used three markers, H and antrofolicular count and AMH, the white or all patient into four groups. Uh, uh, group one and uh, group two uh, is classified at, as unexpected low ovarian response. The others is, uh, are classified expected low ovarian response. What does it mean? Uh, if you if the patient is classified as unexpected poor responder, there are many explanations for about that. But the first one is low gonadotropin starting dose. Poseidon 1 and 2 guru, uh, two should be evaluated with follicle ovarian uh, oocyte index. What is uh, that? The follicle uh, oocyte index is the ratio of the number of antral follicle count at the beginning of ovarian stimulation and the number of oocyte retrieved at the end of ovarian stimulation. If she uh, has only, she, she has under uh, 50 percentage of uh, follicle oocyte index, I mean low follicle oocyte index. At next time, you need to adjust starting FSH dose and you need to increase starting FSH dose for the management of, of this patient. You can also use art calculator. What is the meaning of art calculator? You can put some uh, patient characteristics in art calculator. You can calculate how many oocyte you need to obtain during IVF treatment to achieve several, some uh, pregnancy chance of pre, uh, uh, pregnancy chance during IVF treatment, and. Uh, moreover, you can use art calculator to calculate how many oocyte we need to obtain during IVF treatment to uh, for the probability having at least one haploid blastocyst. If the patient uh, is classified Poseidon group one, you have two choices for the management of this patient. You can increase recombinant FSH dose at the beginning of ovarian stimulation at net for next cycle. And you can consider uh, adding recombinant LH to recombinant FSH. In group two, you have two choices. The first one is to uh, uh, use uh, high uh, starting FSH dose. Actually, I mean 300, uh, 300 FSH dose. And you also uh, consider dual stimulation approach for the management of uh, group two, Poseidon group two. What about the Poseidon group three and four? If the patient is classified Poseidon group three, three you can use in your daily practice a high uh, F starting FSH dose 300. Uh, in group four, you can use uh, the combination of recombinant FSH and to uh, with uh, recombinant LH. What does extra guidelines say? They also classify all patients into three uh, groups according to ovarian response, low response, normal response, high response. They recommend the use of antagonist protocol with this dosage in uh, low responder patient, uh, in, nor uh, uh, in normal responder patient, they recommend the use of agonist protocol with this dosage, and in high responder, they recommend the use of agonist or antagonist protocol with uh, this gonadotropin dosage. Uh, the last one of my presentation, I'm gonna show that the consensus, according to that the consensus, you can use fixed standard protocol, fixed standard FSH dose for the management of normal and poor sponder patient at the beginning of ovarian stimulation before making a decision to classify all patients according to ovarian reserve and uh, ovarian response. You can use several markers, including H, AMH, and antral follicular count. What about the magic number? The best protocol is one that allows recovery of eight uh, to uh, 14 oocyte. 
Thank you for your attention. Dr. Özcan, thank you very much for your kind presentation. We got really, really good uh, evidence from the scientific literature. Uh, as we already mentioned, we are going to collect all questions at the end of the session. Now, I am passing to Professor Hatem El Gamal. Uh, Professor Hatem El Gamal is specialized in infertility, reproduction, reproductive surgery, and obstetrics gynecology as well. He is a gynec professor of gynecology in Aim Shams University. And now today, we are very, very glad to see him uh, with all together. He is going to summarize us the novel Luther. Professor El Gamal, the field is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Dr. Emery. I am uh, happy to be with you in this uh, valuable meeting. Uh, I am very grateful to the organizing committee. Today, we will discuss the Lutean phase support in both uh, and the uh, frozen transfer. First of all, uh, it has been known for ages that the endometrium must first be primed by the E2 during the follicular phase before responding to the uh, estrogen and the progesterone produced by, by the corpus luteum. And during the follicular phase, the estrogen induces the proliferation of the, uh, during the uh, follicular phase, the estrogen induces proliferation of the endometrial glands and the stroma, as in the figure, uh, by increasing the endometrial thickness on the ultrasound. The crucial step in the endometrial effect uh, of the uh, E2 in the development of the E2 and the progesterone receptors. Uh, what is the difference between the stimulated IVF cycles and the natural cycle? First of all, in the stimulated IVF cycle, we have supra-physiologic estrogen levels in the follicular phase. Number two, we have rapid changes in the estrogen progesterone levels in the luteal phase after follicle aspiration. And number three, most of the IVF cycles involve administration of DGNRH analogs or an agonist or antagonist physiologic hostility necessary for the adequate corpus luteum function is disrupted, leading you to well-described luteal phase defect and dysfunction. And so we have a uh, disrupted luteal phase. We must uh, have a luteal phase support in the IVF cycles. We have no IVF cycles without luteal phase support. So what are the methods of luteal phase support? We have, we can administer H H HCG and we can use the progesterone, which is the actually used the progesterone can be used by several methods, vaginal, intramuscular, rectal, and can also use its oral. And we can use the recombinant LH and the bolus doses of the general H agonists. Systematic review in 2015, Cochrane, uh, of 94 randomized control studies support using of the progesterone, HCG, or gender H agonist supplementation, and the results will, uh, we do, they do the uh, Cochrane uh, between the HCG placebo or no treatment, progesterone versus no treatment, progesterone versus HCG, progesterone versus estrogen progesterone, and progesterone versus progesterone and G and H agonist findings suggested the benefit of use of the progesterone group in the life, birth, or ongoing pregnancy rates, and ovarian hyperstimulation was least reported with the progesterone group. What about, so we have the progesterone uh, for the support of the luteal phase. What are the regimens of the progesterone? There are many comparisons between the progesterone regimens. Intramuscular versus vaginal. Vaginal rings versus vaginal gel. Subcutaneous progesterone versus vaginal gel. Vaginal versus rectal, there was no significant difference or there is no evidence of difference between both groups. We all groups, we can use the progesterone with different methods uh, with the same results. What's about the dose of the progesterone? An appropriate dose of any medication for any indication 
should be the dose that will be optimally effective, convenient to administer, and as well as cost effective. So the progesterone, we can use it as intramuscular progesterone preparation from 100 milligram daily, or vaginal progesterone preparation from 400 milligram daily between 400 and 800, or vaginal micronized progesterone capsules 600 milligram daily that it takes a two milligram thrice a day. And uh, uh, the dose of the progesterone, micronized progesterone vaginal gel, again, single dose of 90 milligram was approved by the FDA for the luteal phase support in ART. For convenience, single medications are preferred, of course, by the patients. Recent large randomized double blinded phase three trial, which is Lotus 1 and Lotus 2, that we will discuss later. On the use of daily 30 milligram oral didrogestrone versus daily 600 milligram micronized progesterone for the luteal free support was published, and the results that the use of the didrogestrone oral was not inferior to the use of the uh, other forms of the progesterone. Vaginal versus intramuscular progesterone in Cochrane review, live birth and ongoing pregnancy rates were higher in the vaginal group. But, uh, however, the statistical heterogeneity was high, and when the random effects of model used, no evidence suggested the difference between the use of vaginal or the intramuscular uh, progesterone. Evidence suggested no difference between the groups on the clinical pregnancy rate. Vaginal progesterone delivers higher progesterone to the endometrium than the intra intramuscular progesterone. What is about the timing of the start of the progesterone? Although the progesterone supplementation, the UTF is, is very important, or it is a must, it is similarly important not to advance the endometrial maturation out of the synchronization with the embryo development. If the starting progesterone supplementation too early in the cycle may have a negative effect on the outcome, starting progesterone too late um, could be equally determined. There is an acceptable window of time between 24 and 48 hours after oocyte retrieval for initiation of the progesterone supplementation with optimum cycle results. Firstly, we, you can, we can start at the day of the oocyte. We can start after 24 hours or we can start after 48 hours but it is late to start at the day of the embryo transfer. Duration. There are still limited data and little consensus about on the necessary duration for the progesterone supplementation in early pregnancy. That's beyond the first positive pregnancy test. Now, in Anderson et al. Uh, 2002 conducted a prospective study in which the patients enrolled in stimulated IVF cycles they found no difference in the miscarriage rates and are urged that progesterone supplementation can be safely withdrawn after the first positive beta subunit HCG results. Abulgari et al. set a prospective study in 2008 uh, to, for the patient to either continuation or discontinuation the progesterone support on the day of the first ultrasound demonstrating positive fetal heart activity. They found no significant differences in the miscarriage rate or the bleeding in early pregnancy between both groups. And they concluded that there was no advantage of continuing progesterone support beyond the time of the first ultrasound the viability study. So we have two durations we use. We can stop the progesterone at the time uh, of positive pregnancy test, or even we can continue till six weeks of your gestation at the time of the first ultrasound viability study. Both, both studies we can follow and both are correct. In general H agonist triggered cycles, these special cycles, general H agonist triggered cycles are characterized. We use, of course, this is these cycles in the antagonist protocols. And we use it uh, in those patients we are afraid from the uh, developing any hyperstimulation. So the general H agonist triggered cycles are characterized by higher degree of luteal phase impairment. This is number one compared to the HCG triggered cycles. 
that this impairment may be overcome by addition of small doses of the HCG to the standard progesterone levels in the luteal support. This is the rescue for these cycles. But this is called the modified luteal phase support that include one or two doses of 100, uh, 1,500 international units of the HCG uh, between the time of trigger and the mid-luteal in addition to the standard progesterone supplementation. This would decrease the incidence of the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome without compromising the pregnancy rate. Frozen embryo transfer cycles. In these frozen embryo transfer cycles, uh, different from the stimulated IVF cycles, there is no endogenous progesterone production in these cycles. And therefore, instead of luteal phase supplementation, there is a need of luteal phase creation or replacement. Just as stimulated cycles, we can use intramuscular progesterone in a dose of 100 milligram daily or vaginal progesterone of 400 milligram twice daily. That's to say, eight milligram progesterone twice daily are the most common progesterone preparations used in these replacement cycles. We don't uh, recommend the use of the oral progesterone in frozen embryo transfer. Oral progesterone, as we will clarify, can be used in the fresh and not the frozen embryo transfer. What's about the didrogesterone? This is the uh, novel uh, molecule that can be used in the IVF or in the supplementation of the luteal phase. Of course, the molecular property structure uh, due to is a retro progesterone stereoisomer of the progesterone with additional of double bond, as we see at the uh, between the carbon number six and the carbon number seven. This only will pint the molecule of the progesterone, change it from the progesterone to the didrogesterone, and this will change or the characteristics of this molecule regarding the effect of the uh, stomach and degradation of the progesterone when it is taken orally, different the structure of the, the progesterone and the progesterone influences the potency and the, the potential side effect pro pro profiles of these uh, progesterones. The progesterone use has been used worldwide since 1964, number of conditions related to the progesterone insufficiency. Overall, clinical and the post-marketing experience supports a well-established and favorable benefit risk profile of the progesterone, the approved indications. The progesterone indications include treatment of dysmenorrhea, treatment of endometriosis, secondary amenorrhea, irregular cycles, treatment of dysfunctional uterine bleeding, treatment of the premenstrual syndrome, treatment of threatened abortion, habitual abortion, and treatment of infertility due to luteal phase defect. And finally, during the luteal support as a part of ART treatment. Randomized trials comparing the progesterone versus micronized vaginal progesterone for luteal phase support by Griesinger 2018, what's called the Lotus 1 and the Lotus 2, they, they conclude that oral progesterone may replace other forms of luteal phase support. Live birth rate of oral progesterone 34.6% versus 30 in vaginal therapy difference was not significant between both groups. So, Lotus program, what is about the Lotus program? Lotus program, this is one of the most robust registration studies for the luteal phase support. We have the Lotus 1 comparing the didrogesterone versus micronized vaginal progesterone capsule, and we have the Lotus 2 versus comparing the didrogesterone versus the micronized vaginal progesterone gel. Lotus 3 program provides clinical evidence versus two most commonly used competitors. So the latest Lotus 1, the design, this is double blind, randomized, multi-center, multinational study comparing the, effic the efficacy, safety, and the tolerability of the oral digestrone 3 milligram, that's to say three tablets or three capsules versus 
They micronize the vaginal capsules. This is 600 milligram daily for the luteal phase support. This is study in 38 sites in seven countries, in Austria, in Belgium, in Finland, in Germany, in Israel, in Russia, and in Spain. The primary outcome would be the pregnancy rate. And this pregnancy rate in the study is defined as the presence of the fetal heartbeat at 12 weeks gestation determined by the transvaginal ultrasound. This is the study schedule for the uh, Lotus study. As we all know, this is the, we do the pregnancy test. So we start uh, after the embryo transfer, the oral didrogesterone and the micronized, not the, uh, we start after the oocyte retriever, sorry, the uh, oral didrogesterone or the micronized vaginal progesterone. And we do pregnancy test at weeks, two uh, weeks. And we do the ultrasound and six weeks gestation. And the end of the hour study will be at 12 weeks gestation. And the inclusion criteria, we have different criteria for the inclusion and the exclusion criteria. But final conclusion of Lotus One, Lotus One determined, demonstrated that oral dead registrone was non inferior to the micronized vaginal progesterone for the presence of the fetal heartbeats at 12 weeks gestation. This is the primary outcome. The secondary outcome rate of the live birth or the new birth assessment were similar between the two groups. Safety and durability or the progesterone treatment had a similar safety profile to the micronized vaginal progesterone with no new uh, safety concerns identified in this study, the implications oral didrogestrone may replace, will replace or may replace the micronized vaginal progesterone at the standard of care for luteal support in the IVF owing to this, uh, the ease of oral administration with lower cost to bear life birth rates, of, especially in Russia. Lotus 2, comparing it to the same uh, as Lotus 1, uh, but we compare uh, the same study, but we compare with the uh, micronized vaginal progesterone gel with the same study uh, schedule. And finally, the conclusion of both Lotus 1 and Lotus 2 in the study, this is Lotus 1 demonstrated that oral progesterone was not inferior and Lotus 2 demonstrated that the oral progesterone was not inferior to the micronized gel. Both studies show similar rates of positive pregnancy tests, clinical pregnancy, live births, and newborn assessment between the two treatment groups. And the safety, both studies demonstrated that oral progesterone and micronized had comparable safety profile and the implications oral progesterone is a valuable alternative of two of the main types of the micronized whether gel or capsules for the luteal phase support due to its patient-friendly oral administration route, the progesterone may replace the micronized vaginal progesterone as a standard of care for luteal phase support in IVF. Use of oral progesterone for luteal support in fresh and not in the frozen, fresh IVF cycles associated with an increase in the live birth Rate, ongoing pregnancy rate and the life birth rates of oral digestion was found. Oral digestion was associated with significantly greater ongoing pregnancy rate at the end of the study and the incidence of congenital, familial, and genetic disorders, oral digestion versus micronized vaginal digestion, no significant impact on the incidence of the adverse events associated with congenital, familial, and the genetic disorders could. Personally, in, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Emery introduced me, I am the head of the Assisted Reproductive Technique Unit in uh, Ain Shams University in Cairo. In our unit, actually, we started to use the oral dead registrone and the luteal phase support we have comparable results uh, for that. We the, the previously used the vaginal uh, progesterone for the support. So we use actually the dead progesterone in a dose of uh, 30 milligram per day 
orally uh, we start actually after the uh, embryo transfer we start actually after the the oocyte retrieval 24 hours this is our protocol or this is the protocol in our units finally conclusions or the stories associated with growing with greater go, greater ongoing pregnancy rate and increased life birth rate compared to the micronized progesterone safety no significant difference was the, uh, identified in terms of, of the essence of congenital familial or genetic disorders finally also or the progesterone may replace the micronized vaginal progesterone as a worldwide standard of care for luteal support in fresh IVF cycles. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Hatem El Gamal, thank you for your very, very nice presentation. And we also, we are also glad to see you around us in this basic infertility panel. Uh, your lecture is very nice and you summarize the all aspects of luteal phase support. Uh, thank you once again. And after the last session, I am going to ask you all uh, questions that come uh, from the audience. We have a couple of questions. So uh, thank you. And I am just switching the other uh, session. Dear attendants, dear colleagues, thank you uh, once again for the organization committee. And I especially thank to the Abbott and the Max Arena company for their very, very kind contribution to this Back to Basics panel. This is the last presentation of the second session. I am going to summarize shortly uh, the oral agents for the luteal phase support. As we all know, in our ART practice, we need implantation. And for this purpose, we need a very good endometrium, prepared endometrium, a very, very good uh, quality uh, blastocyst. In, in other words, embryo. However, we need an another thing that definitely we need progesterone uh, for the implantation process. The progesterone is not only uh, triggering the reproductive changes and secretory changes in the endometrium, but also it immune modulation effect of this progesterone uh, obviously helps the precise implantation process. And according to the literature data, if we have low mid-luteal uh, serum progesterone levels in pregnancies, the miscarriages are nearly eight times higher than compared to normal mid-luteal progesterone levels. As Professor Gamal perfectly introduced and summarized that we need luteal support in stimulated cycles, the first just due to the over-suppressed LH levels, and secondary and much more important, we are suppressing the pulsatile LH uh, secretions by just inducing very, very high estradiol levels. And the level of evidence, the, the randomized control studies demonstrated that if we support the luteal phase, our live birth rate is going to be tremendously increased. So what do we have as for the luteal phase support? We have oral preparations, uh, progesterone capsules, progesterone tablets, and also the intramuscular and subcutaneous parenteral forms of progesterones. And this is the very latest survey. This is a 10-year follow-up on the practice uh, of the clinicians. Uh, when we compare to 2009, 12, 18, and 19, we have four surveys previously. All other surveys, and the latest one, showed us that the clinicians are still prefer vaginal progesterone in their uh, ovarian stimulation cycles. So let me check the oral progesterone and vaginal progesterone bioavailabilities. After uh, ingesting the oral capsule of 100 milligrams progesterone, the progesterone serum levels tremendously increase and then go back. And when you use vaginal gel, uh, it's going to be increased more slowly than the oral capsules and decrease also more and more slowly when we compare to oral capsules. And according to literature, 50 milligrams per day, and at least these are the least doses of progesterone, 90 milligram vaginal progesterone insert, 300 milligrams vaginal progesterone capsules, and 25 milligrams subcutaneous progesterone showed equal clinical effect in fresh embryo transfer cycles. So let's 
uh, further switch to oral agents. We have two oral agents. The first one is micronized progesterone. The other one is didrogesterone. Didrogesterone is a retro progesterone with one additional uh, the one additional uh, modification in its in its structure, and it's a retro progesterone as well. And when we compare it to vaginal progesterone capsules, in other words, natural progesterone capsules, the bioavailability is nearly three or four times higher. And it translates into uh, the didrogesterone dose is nearly 20 times lower than progesterone gel or capsules uh, just due to its higher bioavailability. And let's look at the sample sizes in phase three registration trials of luteal phase support. The standard of care is still vaginal use, as I already demonstrated from the latest survey. But uh, as you can easily check, the phase three registration trials of these preparations are uh, not so much. It's less than 1,000 cases. In, other, uh, in the other hand, let me look at the oral didrogesterone. It's already more than 2,000 cases in phase three registration trials. Professor El Gamal perfectly summarized Lotus 1 and 2 trials. I am just going to switch it. Uh, the, the, the first result is going to be Lotus 1. When we compare didrogesterone to micronized vaginal progesterone capsules in fresh embryo transfer cycles, the live birth rates are pretty comparable in two arms. And when you look to Lotus 2 results, the same uh, results are really striking. They also the ongoing pregnancy rates and the live birth rates in full analyzer sample is quite comparable for didrogesterone and micronized vaginal progesterone gel. And finally, if we look at the individual patient data, uh, these results are from comparative RCTs both from Lotus 1 and 2. And if you put these two RCTs together and compare with the vaginal forms of progesterone, oral forms was associated with a significantly higher chance of ongoing pregnancy rates beyond 12 weeks of gestation. And this is also a meta-analysis comparing the RCTs and also it demonstrated a statistically significant difference in pregnancy rate between oral and micronized vaginal progesterones. So uh, maybe some colleagues will have some safety issues and concerns that let me check the safety issues. This is the combined population data of Lotus 1 and 2. This is the incidence of treatment emergent adverse events. And if you Look the conclusion data, and there is no clinically relevant differences in safety and tolerability between these two forms. And what about the maternal safety in liver uh, metabolism? The, these two forms of progesterones are also uh, revealed the same safety profile in terms of maternal liver function tests. And also, there are no significant difference in terms of newborn, familial, and gen genetic disorders between these two forms. Uh, in the scientific uh, arena, uh, or in our daily practice, we are facing with a lot of questions that, uh, do you have any concerns regarding didrogesterone use, especially for the major fetal cardiac adverse events? So, in the recent years, uh, some clinicians published uh, these kind of uh, safety issues. On the other hand, that paper was retracted, and this is a very, very recent one. It's an impress review. And this key message shows us that uh, up to now, we have very, very good data accumulated. And as uh, El Gamal uh, demonstrated, uh, it seems that there is no causal association with fetal abnormalities and didrogesterone can be 
used for miscarriage prevention without any safety concerns up to now, at least because uh, a lot of countries are using the progesterone for uh, you know many 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 years, and to date there is no safety concerns or guidelines uh, from that country's uh, legal uh, safety issues or Ministry of Health. So, to summarize, the progesterone in fresh IVF cycles are efficient. It seems safe, up to now at least. Uh, they are convenient and patient convenience and tolerability are uh, pretty nice. And the doctor preference is acceptable because uh, you are just prescribing an uh, oral agent. And the financial issues are uh, really uh, shows the good beneficial and advantages uh, in terms of the progesterone. So what about the frozen cycles? In frozen cycles, it is really important to prepare endometrium uh, in to, to you know to trigger your progesterone receptors. You can use estrogen and pills or patches. We call it HRT fat cycles. You can use uh, the ovulation induction or you can use the natural follicle growth with spontaneous LH surge. These are the, all different modifications of the endometrial preparation. But first of all, let me focus on the programmed fat cycles. In other words, HRT fat cycles that you are using estradiol, you are suppressing the follicular growth, and you will not have any corpus luteum in your endometrial preparation cycles. We have that we call it HRT fat cycles. Um, and as you can easily uh, understand that it, in HRT fat cycles, you have lack of corpus luteum and you should definitely support the luteal phase to some extent in order to prevent early miscarriages and to sustain your implantation rates. These are very really nice two randomized control trials that both are coming from the United States. The both trials demonstrated that if you use only vaginal progesterone and daily 400 milligrams, when compared to parenteral 50 milligrams intramuscular, your miscarriages will be tremendously high and your live birth rates and ongoing pregnancy rates will be low. So it is very important to support the luteal phase. If you are using vaginal progesterone, you should increase your dose to some extent. How you are going to increase the dose? Uh, the scientific literature is quite limited right now, but at least 800 milligrams or more. What about the oral progesterone in frozen cycles? We have a couple of studies up to now. Uh, the both are coming from the, the Iran or China, and but they are not randomized trials, at least. Uh, we published uh, the three-arm pilot randomized control trial in HRT fat cycles that uh, we transferred only one or two very good quality blastocysts in good prognosis patients. We allocated these into three arms. The first arm is the oral progesterone. The second arm is the uh, vaginal progesterone, 90 milligrams twice daily. And the third arm is 100 milligrams uh, intramuscular progesterone. We used 40 milligrams of oral progesterone in our oral arm only. And as for the outcomes, the ongoing pregnancy rates and the live birth rates per embryo transfer are quite comparable in these three progesterone support arms. And patients with at least one side effect is uh, statistically significant in statistically significant high in intramuscular progesterone arm, as we expected. This is in another study, the Mydron study. It's a prospective cohort one. These are also uh, evaluating the HRT fat cycles using estradiol tablets, and they used 800 milligrams of vaginal progesterone, and the other arm is 800 milligram vaginal plus oral progesterone uh, to, to support the luteal phase. And finally, the key finding is there is a statistically significant lower rate of miscarriage at below 12 weeks in the combined arm versus the progesterone only arm and the live birth rates respectively uh, <coughs> uh, show 46 percent versus 41 percent and congenital anomaly rate highly similar between these two groups 
As for the last slide, things change with time. And just before the Lotus 1 and 2 trials, the clinicians are really uh, afraid about the oral gestrone use only in their fresh IVF cycles. But now, the many more clinicians are adjusting their luteal phase supports in oral, with oral didrogesterone. However, we need some data. Uh, it could be a new standard of care in fresh IVF cycles. It could be a promising option in fat cycles, especially in in natural or modified natural cycles, but for the HRT fed cycles, we need some more studies. And the number of other usages in women health and ART, such as the miscarriages, threatened uh, pregnancies, irregular cycles, are still under investigation. And uh, digestion seems to be a matter of debate for a while. Thank you for your attention. Um, I would like to thank you all contributors and uh, speakers in the second session of this Back to Basics panel. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. And let me ask these questions to, to the firstly to, to Dr. Rozjan. The first question is, is there any difference in cumulative live birth rates in patients receiving mild or standard ovarian stimulation? <laughs> Exactly, it depends on the ovarian uh, response of patient. Uh, uh, as I said in my uh, presentation, first, uh, before making a decision, uh, we need to classify all patients undergo IVF treatment according to ovarian response. In, uh, uh, in uh, hypo uh, response and normal response patient, we can use standard uh, FS, uh, starting FSH dose uh, for the management of uh, this patient. There is no difference in terms of uh, outcome, actually primary outcome uh, as live birth rate uh, for the management of uh, normal and poor responder patient when compared to uh, conventional pr protocol. Uh, that's why we're going to use uh, for the management of normal and poor responder, uh, standard protocol, mild, actually, I mean. Okay, thank you, Dr. Özcan. Uh, Professor Elgamal, in your routine daily practice, uh, what is your standard of care in normal responder patients with normal AMH, with normal antral follicle count, to, to start with a relatively lower or higher gonadotropin doses? Uh, I know. Uh, thank you for your question. In normal practice, we uh, start with the standard dose of the, uh, depending on, of course, the age uh, of the patient, the uh, body mass index, uh, and the antral follicle count, uh, to also with the anti malarial hormone. And uh, we start with the standard dose 150 uh, uh, gonadotrophin, and we almost use the uh, antagonist protocols nowadays. So this is what we standard we can use in uh, our uh, center. Uh, we still use always the antagonist protocol. Uh, oh, thank you, Dr. El Gamal. How about your luteal phase support? <clears throat> what is your routine in your daily practice? In uh, fresh cycles? Daily practice uh, uh, our routine uh, from from your lecture uh, actually now uh, we uh, our routine we use first we we use the intramuscular but nowadays we use the vaginal progesterone but actually in our center and in my practice mm -hmm. we combine the both the use of the vaginal progesterone and the uh, oral progesterone in both fresh and the frozen uh, embryo transfer. So we use 400 milligram vaginal, and we also use three, uh, 30 milligram didrogestrone. This is in my own practice and in our unit. And we are doing nowadays a study about, uh, as you study, uh, about the use of the oral didrogestrone combined with the vaginal with the vaginal progesterone in case of the frozen embryo transfer. But actually, our standard now in fresh is the use of 400 milligram progesterone plus 330 milligram didrogestrone. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor Adama. 
So the, the other question is about the progestin primed ovarian stimulation cycles. Do you have any experience about these uh, protocol with different types yes. of progesterones? Yes, uh, as we know, we have a, a, a global problem in the uh, uh, medications, especially in our country. Uh, we have a problem in the presence of the GnRH. Uh, so we can use, we use the prime, progesterone prime, and we have successful results. But of course, if we use this uh, method, we do freeze all for uh, those uh, cycles and uh, also in case of the oocyte preservation we also use the progesterone uh, prime cycles and in these cycles we start the uh, progesterone we use the progesterone from the second day of the cycle we use 30 milligram progesterone till the day of the uh, oocyte return Actually, and then we do freeze all, of course, uh, if it is married, we can do freeze all for the uh, embryos. And if we do oocyte uh, preservation, we do freeze all for the oocytes. And we have a good experience in uh, this protocol, and it is successful protocols for us in our unit. <clears throat> so this information is very uh, important for us, Dr. El Gamal, that you are using these registrants starting from second day of the cycle, and just proceeding on till day of oocyte retrieval uh, yes. with 30 milligrams, am I right? This, this is our, our protocol, but okay. some, some, some uh, we have also some uh, units in other uh, universities in Cairo, they use only for uh, 10 days starting from the day five of the cycle, but our protocol and the successful protocol for us for the production of the M2, uh, oocytes and good uh, embryos, we use the dendrogestrone uh, 30 milligram from the second day of the cycle. Okay, thank you. Dr. Özcan, what's your experience about the progestin prime stimulation? You know, nowadays it's really uh, hard to find antagonist protocol. That's why I am uh, switch my protocol with uh, progesterone priming. Nowadays I have many experience about that. Uh, I'm gonna start. Uh, actually, I use. Uh, I'm gonna use uh, oral progesterone, didrogesterone during uh, progesterone priming uh, stimulation. Uh, flex. Actually, uh, I would like to use uh, oral progesterone flexible. Uh, I'm gonna starting uh, approximately when the dominant follicle reach uh, 14 millimeters. Okay, so you are using didrogesterone or other forms of progestins? Didrogesterone. Okay, okay, didrogesterone. So what about the natural cycle frozen embryo transfers, uh, whether triggering with the HCG or not? Uh, is it okay for you to add any forms of progesterones in natural fat cycles? Dr. El Gamal, what do you think that? Actually, we actually we we don't use uh, natural cycle uh, 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 several times, uh, but uh, if we use the natural cycle, uh, I personally don't believe in any IVF without uh, progesterone support. And so, uh, if we use the natural cycle, in spite of the presence of the corpus luteum, and so I will add the uh, oral, at least oral, or like the didrogestrone or the drone uh, for the UTFS support. Okay. Uh, how about you, Dr. Özcan? Yes, in my daily practice, actually, I would like to use artificial frozen embryo transfer. Then almost there is no um, natural cycle uh, for a frozen embryo transfer. That's why we know because of the pre uh, absence of uh, corpus luteum, we need to use high uh, progesterone dosage uh, as Lutealpha support uh, during um, artificial frozen embryo transfer. Uh, actually, during uh, artificial frozen embryo transfer, I would like to use a uh, vaginal form. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, take a look at serum progesterone level before embryo transfer. Uh, if uh, I notice the um, serum progesterone uh, level uh, uh, low uh, 10 uh, 
10, I'm going to make rescue therapy with subcutaneous progesterone. Yeah, it's now it is very popular. So uh, I think we have no further questions. I would like to thank all of our guests, speakers and audience and also Professor El Gamal for his nice contribution uh, from a very, very far away. <laughs> So I hope to see you. Hope to see you once again in our upcoming meetings. Uh, and also, I would like to thank the Professor Rezjan for her nice, nice contributions, and Dr. Maria McKen as well. So uh, I would like to thank the Global Tourism and also Abbott and the Max Erno companies for their kind contributions uh, as well. So today we are just finalizing our uh, presentations. Thank you once again, and hope to see you all in the near future. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.